you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of Exodus chapter 20. I'm going to be reading just one verse from there. I'm going to be jumping around today. But we're continuing a series that we've called the Ten. And uh, before we get into that, if you're a first-time guest, we are so glad you're here. We want to welcome you. Can we give it up for all our first-time guests? You are special to us. And so make sure you fill out that card that you should have got on your way and stop in. We have a table in the lobby. We have a free gift for you. You can choose a bag, a reasonable grocery bag, or a mug, right? We give options here. So uh, stop in and get that free gift, and we just want to connect with you and welcome you here. But we're continuing this series called The Ten, and this is a series through the Ten Commandments. And so we hit the first two over the last few weeks, and now today I'm hitting number three. And uh, this is one that I believe is maybe the most confusing, the most misused, misunderstood, abused uh, of all of the commandments. I think it's one that I've been in church a long time, man. I'm a pastor's kid, grew up in the church, so I have way more problems than you, I guarantee you. But uh, I, I have never heard in person a message on this. And it's this topic of do not take God's name in vain. And so that's what I'm going to be hitting today, number three of these Ten Commandments. And I believe that God's going to speak to us here today, though. He's got something for us. And so let me read Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. It says here, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Jesus Speak to us. Give me the clarity to share what it is you want your people to hear in this place today. In your name, amen. So back in the day, uh, I had a movie that I loved. I still love this movie, but it's a movie called Remember the Titans. Anybody remember this movie? You remember? Remember the Titans? It's a great one. Man, about segregation and races coming together, football. I mean, this is it's one of those epic movies uh, starring a young Hayden Penetere. She was a little girl in it. You guys remember that? But uh, anyways, this is, a, this is one of my favorite movies. And so it, it came to my mind this week as I was preparing for this message because there was a part of the movie where one of the main characters, his nickname was Rev. And they called him Rev because he would preach and um, he'd always talk about Jesus. He loved Jesus and he'd share scripture. So they called him Rev. It was short for Reverend, right? So he was the spiritual one on the team. And so there's this one scene where one of the guys gets upset, and he yells. He yells out, Jesus Christ. But he doesn't say it in a good way, right? He says it in a cuss word kind of way. So he says, Jesus Christ. And the Rev responds, and he says, you praise his name. You praise his name. And so I've used that ever since. So you all can take it and use it. I'm out on the basketball court playing some pickup. Someone says, Jesus Christ. I go, you praise his name. Works every time, all right? So you guys can try to implement that into your lives. But we hit the first command, which was no other gods. There should be no other gods before me. Then we hit the second command of worship me only. And we talked about idols. Uh, Jason talked about that last week, did a great job. And then today I'm talking to you about don't take my name in vain. That's what God said. Don't take my name in vain. I want you to hear this because God tells us his name in scripture. We see he gives us his name. He named himself. And so in our culture, you know, people would say, oh, well, we all worship the same God. Like different religions, different names for God, but it's the same God. And I'm here to tell you, we don't believe that. We believe there's one God. He named himself. We don't name him. And there's something that sets our God apart from all the other gods, and that he sent his son but his son died for us, sacrificed himself for us. But here's the thing that sets our religion, Christianity, apart from every other religion, is that our God didn't stay dead. Every other religion, their gods died and stayed dead. But in Christianity, Jesus Christ died, but he didn't stay dead. He came back again. He rose to life. And now he sits at the right hand of the Father, and he's coming back one day. Coming back for his people, for you and for me. And so... Our God, though, he named himself, and we see in Scripture, in the Old Testament, the name that he used for himself is used almost 7,000 times in the Old Testament, and it's the name Yahweh. 
This was the name, the Hebrew word Yahweh that they gave for God. This is the word they used to define God or Lord. When you often see Lord in uh, the Old Testament when you're reading, it's the, it's the name Yahweh that is there. That's the original language. Now, the Jews in this day, they were so respectful and so almost fearful of the name of God that they wouldn't even say it. Most of the Jews would never speak the name Yahweh for fear of misusing it. I think that's interesting for us because today we throw God's name out all over the place. We use it to swear. We use it when we're angry. We use it when we're happy. We use it when we're excited. We use it when we stub our toe. And so this reality of the Jews being so respectful of God's name, they wouldn't even say it, I think is a powerful thing. But before we can really jump into this and, and understand, like, what does it mean to take God's name in vain, I think we have to define what does vain mean. What does vain, the word vain, mean? And if we look at the original language, we find and see that translated, the word vain means emptiness, falsehood, in a way that is trivial, light, inconsequential, or small. And so what I believe we do today is we make light of God's name, we make God's name inconsequential, we make God's name small, we disrespect God's name, we bring almost a falsehood to God's name because we'll do things like swearing by his name and yet not follow through on those promises, ushering in falsehood to the name of God. So there's an opposite command to every one of the Ten Commandments here in Matthew 7, 9, or in Matthew 7, 9, it says, Our Father, so Jesus is telling us how to pray. He says, this is how you should pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. This is the opposite of taking God's name in vain. It's respecting God's name, first and foremost. Bringing a respect. So I want you to hear this because the Ten Commandments, sometimes we see them and we're like, oh, that's kind of just old school, old commands. But the tagline of this series is set free, to live free or, or freed up to live it up is what we're saying. Because what had happened is the Jews were in captivity. They were slaves in Egypt for years, hundreds of years. And then finally Moses comes in, the ten plagues follow him, and Pharaoh finally says, fine, go, you can go. They cross over on dry land, walking through the Red Sea. God sets them free. And yet now they've been set free, yet they're more enslaved than ever before to their sin. And a lot of us are the same way. We're set free by God, and yet we're still enslaved by our sin. You see, these Israelites, these Jews, they were taking God's name in vain. They were committing adultery. They were stealing. They were lying. Uh, they were coveting what their neighbor had. They were doing all these things, and God's going, you're free, and yet you're more enslaved than ever before. And so God gave them these lists, this list of ten commandments to help their lives. And sometimes we look at the Bible and we're like, oh, it's just holding me back. God's word isn't there to hold you back. It's there to set you free. God's word is there to propel you forward. God's word is there to give you the best life. And that's why we have to get a hold of it. And we have to love it. We have to let it soak into our hearts and our spirits because God's word gives us a better life. It makes us live better. It makes us love better. It makes us bring hope better to this world, a hopeless world. So what I want to do today is I want to look at ways that we take the Lord's name in vain. Because some of you are sitting out there and you're like, okay, so this is just going to be if I say GD when I get mad, um, then uh, that's all I got to do and I'm good. Like this is pretty easy commandment. You're going to preach a whole message on this, Caleb, or, or you're out there. So all I got to do is not say like Jesus Christ, I want to get angry and, and I'm good. But no, because we don't understand truly what this meant. And so we're going to really look at what does it really mean and how do you and I take God's name in vain and we do it all the time. So, number one. First way we take the Lord's name in vain is foolish promises or false promises. Matthew 5, 33 and 34 says, Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is, by the, it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Jesus is talking here. He says, you don't even have to take an oath. Just let your yes be yes. If you're going to do something, do it. If you're going to say you're going to do something, just do it. 
Leviticus 19.12 says, Do not swear falsely by my name, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You see, I believe God opposes perjury. And I think you got to understand here that this idea of taking the Lord's name in vain is not just about cussing or swearing or saying God when you're mad. It also is entailing covenants, legal or personal situations where you make a commitment to someone. You make a promise to someone and you bring God into it and yet you break it. When you do that, you're taking his name in vain. Marriage. Today's marriages, 50% end in divorce according to statistics in our culture. The church isn't much better. Why? Because we've made light of it. It's a promise. It's a covenant between God and people. And yet we've made light of this thing. We brought falsehood to this thing. You know, little kids do this. They go, cross my heart and hope to die, right? Stick a needle in my eye. I pinky swear. I pinky promise. Right? We make promises. I, I like to sing a song to my wife often. I go, I swear by the moon. Okay, I'm done. I know you guys are impressed. You know, I, I would say to you, we, so many, and I, I'm guilty of this. When I was a kid, I used to be like talking to my brother and my friends. I'd be like, I swear, man, bring a Bible. Bring a Bible. I swear, I'll put my hand on it. Or I, I swear, I swear to God. I swear to God. There, I promise you, I swear. And we do these things. And I would say this, man, unless you're 100% certain that you're going to keep it, you better be careful when you swear in God's name. I, I went to uh, Bible college, and I played basketball there. And so as a result, I have practice jerseys um, from playing basketball there. And they literally say Central Bible on them. And so every once in a while, I'll be going to play some pickup or going to play some basketball, and I'll throw one on, like not thinking. I'll throw it on, and, and you all know, like I've told you stories. Those of you that are new here, you'll, you'll learn soon that uh, I tend to get in trouble because I'm overly competitive. Um, tend to get a little heated fights on, on the basketball court. But let me tell you something. When I walk into the gym, and I look down, and right underneath my number, it says Bible, I think differently about how I'm going to act, don't I? Like when I walk into the gym, i got to shift my mindset. I go, all right, Caleb, like, you're wearing a Bible jersey, central Bible. Like, chill out, tone it down, just be cordial, be kind when you walk out on the court. And I always play different. I act different. But I was thinking about this, and, and I think for us that follow God, and if you're in this place and you're not a Christian, we're so glad you're here. One thing we always say here at Project Church, you don't have to believe to belong. You're welcome. Uh, we want to walk this faith journey out with you. Um, I know some of you aren't believers, but I want to tell you right now, we believe that Jesus believes in you. We believe that Jesus has a plan for you, and we believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and he loves you. But for you Christians in here, I think we've made a covenant before God. We've said, God, I'm going to live for you. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to follow you. We've made this promise, and yet our actions so often don't look like it. I think we need to think more like I do when I walk on the court and I'm wearing a central Bible jersey that I'm going to act different. We need to be living that way. We need to be living like, man, it says Jesus across my chest. We need to be living like, man, it says Bible right below my number. That wherever we go, whatever we do, whatever we're saying, however we're at, whatever situation we're in, we're thinking, I've made a promise to God. I've made a promise to follow God. I've made a promise to serve God, and I need my actions. I want my actions. I'm going to strive for my actions to back that up, to reflect that. But you see, we, we make promises that we don't follow through on. So many of us, and when we do this, we do it in God's name often. We're taking his name in vain when we don't follow through. Number two. Second way we take the Lord's name in vain is by fake prophecies. And I'm talking to church people here right now because this is a churchy term, prophecy. What does that mean? Well, the word prophecy literally means an edifying or encouraging word over someone's life, over a person or a group of people. Now, this also entails and was connected to a word from God over someone's future. And so what I have seen and what I think happens is what happened in Jeremiah. And Jeremiah 14, 14 says, the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying lies 
in my name. And so what I've seen and what I think happens is sometimes people will attach God to things that they're speaking over themselves or over someone else. And they're saying it's in God's name, but God hasn't sent them and God hasn't actually told them that. So for example, I was in college and uh, this girl, I was friends with her, just friends. And uh, one night she asked if we could hang out and I said, all right, yeah, sure, we'll hang out. And she said she wanted to talk to me. So I'm like, okay, cool. So we go, and I'm thinking like she's going to tell me she likes me. Just had a feeling, and I, I, we were just friends. I wasn't really into her like that, but uh, I go hang out with her, and that night she sits me down, and here it comes. She's like, I wanted to talk to you about something. I'm like, okay, I'm getting ready. And she goes, God told me that you're going to be my husband. I was like, snap, girl, he ain't told me. <laughs> you better get out. <laughs> you walking home. But it was one of those things where she tried to use God, right? God told me you're going to be my husband. That's a fake prophecy, a false prophecy. Don't attach God's name to something that you want. Now, I believe God gives us the desires of our heart. The problem is our hearts often desire wrong things. Our hearts often desire fleshly things, things that God hasn't actually spoken to us. So we have to be careful that we follow God's will and not what we want. You know, I know a guy, he told me that God told him he was going to be a famous rapper. I was like, that's dope, man. That's legit. Like, let me hear some of your rhymes. And so he sent me one of his raps, a couple of his raps, and I got it, and I listened to it, and I was like, bro, you ain't never going to be a famous rapper. <laughs> never. Not unless American Idol of rappers comes out and you're like one of those beginning, you know, episodes where they make fun of people. Like, unless that's, that's the only way. Now, I didn't say this to him. I was like, man, this is awesome. I just want to say we're in our mid-30s right now and he's not a famous rapper. But who knows? There's still hope, I guess. But for me, it was one of those moments like, man, this is what you want. But it's not what God has really spoken. Don't attach God's name to things that it's just that you want. We have to be careful. Be certain God has spoke before you say God has spoke. And I see this being abused in the church, and that's why I wanted to bring it up. Men out there, win a woman over. Don't just try to throw out God told me that you're going to marry me, especially when she don't even know you. God told me you're going to marry me. She's like, I've never even talked to you before. <laughs> Doesn't work. Number three, third way we take God's name in vain is false pretenses. We have false pretenses. Matthew 7, 21 through 23 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. This is like scary stuff right here. I want you to hear it. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, and he's saying on that day when people are standing before God after their life is over, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. This is kind of scary. Because I'm reading that, I'm going, wait a second. They like did godly things in God's name. It seems like godly things in God's name. And he's saying he didn't know them. He's saying depart from me. Why? Because they didn't do it for God. They did it for them. They didn't do it to bring praise and glory to God, they did it to elevate themselves. And we can be guilty of this in the church. We can be guilty of this as Christians. These false pretenses. These people were using God, using God's name for their own benefit. You know, I, I've seen this a lot. There's a lot of Christian business owners out there. Maybe you're one. You're one of them. And I, I'm okay with Christian business owners. That's awesome. I've seen Christian business owners that put like a Jesus fish on their business card or on their sign. There's like a Jesus fish or there's like a, a scripture and that's awesome. Like if I had the choice between going to a person who's just some random mechanic or a person who loves Jesus and proclaims to be a Christian, I'm going to pick the Christian mechanic every time. Why? Because they're like, they're my family. I mean, we're, we're a part of the same family. We have the same future. We have the same hope. We both love Jesus. I'm going to pick them every time. But here's the problem is people use Jesus, use God's name, but their business practices don't reflect anything that looks like God. So if you're a business 
owner in this place, and you're going to attach God to what you're doing. You're going to put a Jesus fish on your card. You're going to talk about how you're a Jesus follower. You're going to put scripture verses on stuff. Your business practices had better reflect that. Don't rip people off. Don't take advantage of people. Don't do shady work. No, because what we do and what people do is they go, oh, I know if I put God on something, I'm going to get more business. But then they don't operate in a way that a God follower should. It's the same way for those of you Christians in here that sometimes maybe you want everyone to know at work that you're a Christian. I don't know why, what the pretense is for that, but some people do that. Maybe they think it elevates them in other people's eyes. They think people will leave them alone more. <laughs> um, they think that um, for whatever reason, it'll help them, give them a leg up in, in the competition. Maybe your boss is a Christian, so you want to let them know you're a Christian. Let me tell you something. If you're a Christian, you're going to let everybody know you're a Christian. You're going to say to everybody that you're a Jesus follower. Your actions have better reflect that. You better work harder than everybody else. You better be on time. I know that's hard for a lot of y'all. It's hard for me. Be on time. Be the hardest worker there. Have the utmost practices. We can't have false pretenses. We take God's name in vain when we use God's name to benefit only us. Fourth is flippant talk. And I'm going to get real with y'all right now, okay? I'm going there. I'm going there right now. Now, the word flippant, everybody say flippant. You got to say it like that too, flippant. Flippant, defined, is not showing a serious or respectful attitude. The Jews so respected the name of God, they so respected this name Yahweh, they wouldn't even speak it, even in spiritual situations. And yet as Christians, we drop GD when we stub our toes. We yell the name of Jesus Christ when someone cuts us off. And we think, oh, it's no big deal. This is another way that we take God's name in vain. So I'm going there with you. Somebody's saying, oh, Caleb, it's not that big of a deal. No, I think it is a big deal. I think God's word tells us it's a big deal. I mean, if the Jews wouldn't even speak the name of God, it was like Voldemort, man, he who must not be named. They wouldn't even say it. The Jews won't even say God's name, and yet we throw God's name every time we get angry. Every time we get frustrated, every time something doesn't go our way. You know, I, I, I'm not going to say, but I have two women in my house, and one of them asked me this week, am I going to feel convicted about this message? And I was like, yes, you are. And uh, one of them 16 months old, so you can figure out who it was. But Ephesians 4.29 says this, let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Our talk should be seasoned with grace. Our words should build up. Our words should be fitting. And yet Christians, I think a lot of us are guilty of dropping this and that, yelling God's name when we're frustrated, angry, and I think we need to be careful, more careful. We need to have more respect. We need to tame the flippant talk that comes out of our mouth. And listen, there's good news, all right? There really is good news. In the middle of the guilt of your sin, of our sin, my sin, is the power of the grace to cover our sin. You see, you're never going to be perfect. You're going to take God's name in vain sometimes by the way you act, by the words you say. But God's grace still covers you. God still forgives you. God doesn't give up on you. And I wanted you to hear this because I think sometimes a message like this we can hear and we're like, man, I suck. <laughs> like, man, I'm in trouble. No, here's the thing. Jesus came and he lived perfectly because he knew we were imperfect. And he took all of our sin, all of our mistakes onto himself. What he's saying to you right now is, look, this is a way to live. But when you fall short, my grace still covers you. My grace is still on you. So here's the main idea I wanted you guys to leave with today. It's this. How you live will either honor the name of God or cause people to question the name of God. And I know that the Christians in here, you want to honor the name of God by the way you live. But so often our actions, our words are taking God's name in vain and we're actually causing everyone around us to question 
who God is, to question his name. So real quick, these are like the contrasts of the four I just gave you. How to live in a way that honors the name of God. Number one, say what you mean and mean what you say. You don't even have to swear by anything. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Follow through on your promises. But if you're prone towards not following through, don't bring God into it. Because a lot of us, not only do we make us look bad, but we make God look bad in the process too. Be a person of your word. It's never easy to hear, I believe, it's never easy to hear that our smallest actions matter, that everything has effect, cause and effect in this world. But James 1 and 26 says, with some strong words, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. You see, what we do, how we follow Jesus, it matters. It has ramifications because it doesn't just affect us. Sometimes we're always just thinking about us. Well, I don't want to take God's name in vain because of me. I don't want to take God's name in vain because I want to be good with God. I don't want to take God's name because I want to have a future. I don't want to take God's name because I want to go to heaven. But the reality is the words we use and the actions we take don't just affect us. They affect everyone we come in contact with. They affect our family, our friends, our coworkers, our daily lives. So we need to be people of our words. Say what you mean, mean what you say. Number two. Learn to distinguish God's voice from your voice. You see, God's voice is different than our voice. And I said earlier that a lot of us, we come and we bring these false prophecies in and, and it's for our gain, like they were doing, when, as Jeremiah stated. But we got to learn to distinguish God's voice from our voice. Make sure that we're not pro propelling and encouraging what we want over what God wants. I know a guy, and hopefully he doesn't listen to this, but, uh, <laughs> but this guy, he's a friend of mine, and, and he's a pastor, and he said to me recently, he said, yeah, God, I believe God wants me to be a pastor to celebrities. I was like, okay, like, that's cool. I don't know if you guys know, like, in this culture, like, we live in a celebrity culture, but then also now we live in, like, a celebrity pastor culture, and a lot of these, like, pastors are pastoring celebrities, which I'm not against that. Like, celebrities need pastors, too, but I asked him, like, why? So I'm like, okay, you feel like God wants you to be this, a pastor of celebrities? Why? Why do you want to be a pastor of celebrities? It's like, because, man, it looks like awesome. It would be so fun. Dude, you play golf with them. You hang out with them. You know, go on trips with them. And, like, just you're there for them, man. It's awesome. It looks fun. It looks, it looks like it would be a crazy ride. I'm like, bro, you're missing it, man. Because it wasn't about them. It wasn't about what he could bring to them or bless them or help them it was about him how people would be able to see on his instagram that him hang out with this guy people would be able to see on his social media that he was a pastor of celebrities you see that was his voice and it wasn't god's voice some of you in here you have a hard time distinguishing god's voice from your voice and i get that we've all had those moments but i would say to you it's really easy actually to distinguish god's voice from your voice all you got to do is make sure it lines up with this. Get in God's word. Get hungry for God's word. Start reading God's word. I joke with you all the time. I say, you know you can open this Monday through Saturday too, not just on Sunday mornings. Get the app. Get a daily reading plan on the YouVersion app. It sends you daily reminders and tells you, read me. If we do this, then when we start thinking, is this me or is this God? If it doesn't line up with God's word, we can go, you know what, that's probably me. But when it lines up with God's word, we can say, you know what? I think it's God. We have to learn to distinguish God's voice from our voice. Number three, let God use you. Don't try to use God. I've seen it in this world. I talked about it with Christian business owners, people that are trying to use God to benefit themselves. That's a dangerous, dangerous game to play. That's a place you do not want to go because when you do that, you're literally taking his name in vain. You know, I was reading this week, and, and something really grieved me. I wanted to share it with you. So I was reading about something that happened with George Zimmerman, Trayvon Martin. You guys remember the story? A few years back, George Zimmerman was a neighborhood watch guy, saw this kid walking down the street, had his hood on, thought he was up to no good, approached him. Apparently a fight ensued. I don't know, all the, I don't know exactly all the details, ramifications, everything that happened. And I'm not here to get political with you. But in the end, he pulled out a gun and shot this 16-year-old kid, killed him. 
And it caused a lot of uproar in our, in our country. Uh, it was a race issue. It was a um, profiling issue. It was a gun issue. I mean, all these different things. I'm not here to talk about that. But I was reading this week because George Zimmerman was auctioning off the gun that he shot Trayvon Martin with. And, like, right away I was upset because I'm like, really, dude, you're going to auction off the gun. Why? To make money. And he said, oh, some of it's going to go, you, you know, to some good, worthy causes and nonprofits. I'm like, yeah, I'm sure some, a small sum, but it's really about you. And so already I was bothered. Like, man, you don't think about this family and the hurt, like whether this, you, you and no matter where you stand on the situation, the kid was in the wrong or not, this is still a family that lost someone. And I'm just going, that's so insensitive. And then I read what George Zimmerman said after the auction completed, and he said this, first and foremost, I would like to thank and give the glory to God for a successful auction. I about kicked my computer over. Bah! 300 style, this is Spartan, I don't know. Let me tell you something, don't attach God to things that are not godly. And I think we do this, and I'm not just coming down on George Zimmer, I'm coming down on us, all of us, because I do this. I do things in my life that are ungodly, and then I try to attach God to them and say, God bless it. God bless this thing I'm doing that is totally contrary to your word, that is hurtful, and hurting people around me, bless this thing. You know, I, I, I had an affair, but, but she's just, I'm so happy for the first time in my life. I was so unhappy with my wife. And so God, just bless this new relationship. Seriously? You want to attach God? You want to ask God to bless something that is outright sin, that is outright disobedience? Don't attach God to ungodly things. Why? Because it's about you. You're using God for you. Let God use you. So I got serious with y'all, but I'm going to get light right now, all right? So then later in the week, I'm so grateful that there are some good stories out there too, right? Later in the week, I opened up my Facebook on Thursday morning, and this video popped up, and it was this chick opening a Chewbacca mask, <laughs> right? Her name is Candace Payne, and, and, and it was right there in my feed, and it's Thursday morning. It's like getting all these shares. I'm like, what is this? So I turn it on, and I'm watching, and it's like for a minute and a half, two minutes, she's just not doing anything. And I don't know why I kept watching, but I'm like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Like this chick is just talking about how she's going to open a Chewbacca mask and watch it. It's on the, she used the Facebook Live option, right? And then she put it on. And since Thursday morning, this video on Facebook Live, on Facebook, has 131 million views as of last night. And that's not including YouTube and all the others. So I thought, we need to watch this real quick. Come on, throw it up for us. Just a small clip. So, yes! Now watch when my mouth actually moves. <laughs> That's not me making that noise, it's the mask! Here, listen. I see this video and I'm like oh wow that was actually hilarious I'm like dying laughing watching it on Thursday morning because the laugh was just infectious right but then I read uh, actually I just read it last night and they did an interview with her and she said this she said my joy comes from my faith in God it's rooted in my love for Jesus and then she went on she talked about how she's a worship leader and volunteers in her church and all these kinds of things and then she told uh, a few stories where she said I got multiple emails from people saying they were struggling with depression but one person in particular said I was struggling I've been struggling with depression for the last two and a half three months and this was the first time I've laughed in all that time and I thought that was so cool because I'm looking at it 
And I'm going, man, we got to let God use us. If we're going to attach God to things, it's got to be things that edify, that build up, things that bring grace and hope and truth and love and joy. God's people. If you're going to attach God to things in your life, they must be biblical and they must be blessings. Your actions that bless people, your steps that bless people, your joy that blesses people. You see, God's people should usher in heaven. God's people should bring blessings to this world, should bring joy to this world. And fourth today, how to live in a way that honors the name of God is respect his name. Respect his name. You see, his name is the name that is above all names, the Bible says. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He's coming back with and for us. We have to respect the name of God. Respect the name of Jesus. Give honor and glory to the name of Jesus. It's not just about not letting that word out when you get mad. It's not just about not saying it when you stub your toe. It's about how you live. Every step that you take, the actions and how you operate in this world, are they bringing honor to the name of God or are they causing people to question the name of God? There's an old saying, it's kind of corny, man. You've probably heard it before. But for most people in this world, you're the only Bible they'll ever read. The only Bible they'll ever read. So how you live matters. Whether you're honoring the name of God or taking God's name in vain matters. Because God placed us here on this earth to be his hands and his feet. He placed us here on this earth to bring heaven to earth. That's why you're here. That's why I'm here. You were made for a purpose and for a plan. To bring honor and glory to God. To bring the glory of God to this earth. You were made to bring heaven to earth. And when people see you, they see God. Let's honor God with how we live. Let's honor God with what we say. Let's honor God with what we do. I don't want to take God's name in vain. I want to bring honor to his name. And I know you do too. But maybe you're in this place, you don't know Jesus, you've never given your life to Jesus, you've never surrendered to Jesus, you're out there going, Kayla, how can I bring honor to the name of God? I don't even know God. Well, today's your day. You didn't come in here by accident. In fact, some of you, maybe you need to take the next step and get baptized in water here in a moment. We got t-shirts and shorts and towels. If you want to do it right now, spur of the moment, let's go. But maybe you're in this place and you've never given your life to Jesus. You've never surrendered to Jesus and you've been saying, yeah, I've been taking God's name in vain by how I've lived and I didn't even know it. Today, you're like, I want to make a change. I want to bring honor to the name of God. Or maybe you're in this room, and you knew God at one point in time. You followed God at one point in time, but you know you've ran. You've turned your back. You've gone after all the wrong things. You've done nothing but, but take his name in vain by the way you've lived, by the things you've said. But today's your day to make a fresh commitment, to recommit, to rekindle that fire that God has for you. Don't walk out of this place stuck. Don't walk out of this place the same. Respond because the love of God is crying out to you. God loved you so much that he sent his son, Jesus, to come down and to live a perfect life and be crucified on a cross because you were imperfect. He did what you couldn't do. But not only that, he loves you on your worst day. He loves you at your lowest moment. He loves you in the middle of your mistake and your mess. He came, he says, I'll take all that. All you got to do is surrender to me. Let's live in a way that honors his name. Would you bow your heads with me across this place?